uh, Angleton and uh, two CIA uh, guys broke into uh, Mary Meyer's apartment the night she was murdered and uh, uh, located her diary uh, with her time uh, with JFK. And uh, the diary uh, was given, I believe, by Angleton to uh, 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 the gal that um, was running uh, Life magazine, uh, Margaret uh, Mead. I can't remember her name. Margaret Mead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. And and then the and then the diary just disappeared. But my father was all, always a, a little upset at the fact that uh, Angleton could go breaking in people's houses and and, uh, and get a pass on it. And then, of course, he he wasn't allowed that that privilege. <laughs> but really, the two the two have nothing to do with each other. I mean, they they don't they're not in the same league. I mean, he's breaking into uh, uh, you know embassies and the Watergate DNC, and and Angleton breaks into Mary Meyer's apartment. So that was always a little kind of thorn in his side. But it it is interesting to me that these such high level people, like a guy meeting directly with Helms. Uh, would be doing a burglary, you know, and, and guys like uh, uh, Sturgis, you know, uh, these hitmen, you know, would be doing this, these little burglaries and wiretapping. Yeah, you know, that, 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 that is really curious. Well, I, I, I know that, um, that the reason they, 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 the reason Nixon wanted my father, because my father had a, had a very, very strong reputation as being a guy that, uh, you know, one foot was on the front lines in, in the trenches and the other foot was in the Oval Office or in the office of Dick Helms. He would he'd have lunch with Dick Helms in the afternoon, and by the evening he was uh, dressed in his khakis and he was training uh, Cuban exiles. He was, my, my dad was a kind of an all-hands type of guy, right. a guy that had a very serious reputation as being someone that uh, would uh, commit, um, you know, uh, a, a killing and or, and or certainly have it done by the best of people. And that's where you have uh, the need for him to be hands-on at the Watergate burglary. I mean, he didn't actually break in himself to the to the Watergate. He was stationed uh, uh, across the street uh, right. monitoring the, the progress of the break-in team. So he was removed once from that um, from, from that immediate situation. But uh, the Cubans were there for my dad. You know, if he said go do this, especially Sturgis, if, if he if he uh, told Frank uh, to go go mur- go kill that guy and, and point a finger at, at a gentleman, Frank would go do it. Uh, any any one of them would have. That's how how much they respected and thought of my dad. And so that's why he needed to be there, not at the actual break in, but monitoring it, part of the team. Uh, supervising it, um, as as was his job, I believe, in the JFK assassination. He wasn't a shooter, uh, he wasn't a tramp, but he was there monitoring the situation in case uh, you know anything needed to be dealt with. Uh, my father had had the answers, uh, uh, you know, to deal with uh, with whatever uh, uh, could have or would have happened uh, during the uh, the hit on Kennedy. So he was, um, you know, that's why he was there, even though he was high up. Um, and, of course, he had uh, publicly retired from CIA, so so there was no direct link. The CIA, uh, you know, uh, when asked, uh, you know, they said, well, uh, no, he retired, uh, you know, six months ago. Uh, uh, he works for a private firm. Uh, we, don't, we don't know what Howard's been doing, which was a, a complete, you know, lie. Uh, he reported directly to Helms. Uh, giving the goods on what Nixon was up to uh, directly to the CIA. Well, let me it's all about infor- yeah. information is power. And, right. you know, Helms wanted someone on the inside, deep cover, uh, to give him the goods on what Nixon was up to. So, but now all along, uh, you know, you're seeing this Spotlight uh, magazine article, you know, and your dad's denying everything. How does it come about that he starts saying to you, hey, hey i got to talk to you about something? Well, here we are. Uh, we're we're in like 2002, and um, I had already read a few things, uh, and of course, for years had known that if I was the alibi, then the alibi wasn't true, right. because because he wasn't at home, and so uh, no amount of of him saying, you know, uh, you remember, son, that I was I was with you that that afternoon. Uh, we sat and watched television and blah, 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 you know, 
that wasn't true. So I knew that there was more to be told. And the tramp photograph did look a lot like my father. So I, I, I did feel that there was something that wasn't being addressed. And I thought if I can get my dad to really come clean in the last times of his life, because he was 2002, he was he was fairly sick. Although he did last, you know, a few more years. Um, his mind was very sharp, very strong, but his body just uh, it, piece by piece was just giving away. You know, his leg was amputated, and he was gonna uh, he wasn't gonna have that amputation uh, until I came down and uh, and begged him to uh, stay alive as the patriarch of the Hunt family that we needed him and we loved him and we valued him and and uh, you know he had been through a lot worse things than that. And, and come out on the other side and uh, and please, you know, don't uh, let gangrene kill you. You know, you, you've got a lot left to offer the world. And he he went through the operation uh, and stayed alive. But um, I got him interested in, um, well, I, I had heard that on the, on the set of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, Nixon movie, they, uh, Oliver Stone had flown my father uh, up to the set uh, to act as technical advisor. And uh, one evening over a uh, uh, dinner with the, the cast and crew, uh, or, or the cast, basically Oliver Stone and uh, uh, Anthony Hopkins and, uh, and my father and, and a few other people, um, uh, Oliver Stone just sort of blurted out, uh, Howard, uh, what would it take to, uh, to get you to tell uh, everything you know about the JFK assassination? My dad put his uh, silverware down and thought for a moment, and he goes, about $5 million dollars. In total dead seriousness. Sure. And then Oliver just like looked at him and like, what, really? And my father said, yeah, I figure it's worth about $5 million considering all the, all the hell I'll have to go through and put my family through uh, if, if that ever happened. And I had heard that story from my brother who was there. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah. I'm oh, the yeah. Edge of my and, seat. and and so that 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 put the germ, the seed, in, into my brain. I thought, well, you know, maybe I can I can broker a deal between uh, uh, between my father and, and interested parties. And then I found out that uh, that um, a friend of my father's named David Giamarco, uh, a Canadian journalist and and TV host, um, had written up a. a coffee table picture book about James Bond uh, in, in which my father wrote the, the preface or the foreword to and uh, and they were friends and Gio Marco um, had been trying to uh, to get my dad to talk about JFK uh, of course he wouldn't but one of Gio Marco's best friends happened to be Kevin Costner Gio Marco had assured my father that if my father had information about the JFK assassination that Kevin Costner would uh, provide the the necessary financial uh, part of of the deal, and uh, and and so there was this whole very strange uh, uh, scene that happened when uh, Kevin Costner uh, flew down on a private jet to uh, uh, to my father's home in Miami, uh, and uh, you know when he he rings the doorbell and uh, you know uh, my father was expecting him, so they they were ready for him, but K Costner apparently walks into my dad's house and in the first five minutes goes uh, so tell me. Uh, uh, you know how did how did you kill JFK? You know, in front of my father's wife, who this was all supposed to be kept from her, and you know my father just it was so rude and so unexpected that uh, that you know they basically asked Costner to just to leave, and that became sort of the genesis of of something. I reached out to David Giamarco and Kevin Costner and and said that uh, look, you guys completely blew this whole thing you you completely handled it wrong said let me see what i can find out from my father if he's interested in in doing a project like this even after this this horrendous scene with mr costner and i'm on the phone to kevin costner a few times and he's talking to me and and uh and and so i i arranged um uh, a deal where um where my father was willing to uh discuss the jfk assassination and his involvement his knowledge prior knowledge of it with uh with with kevin costner who was then going to be the presenter to the world uh, of 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 this uh of this part of history and um and so we developed this code where we wanted to give uh, costner and Giamarco enough information where they they knew that this was the real deal and substantial, 
but at the same time to keep names and dates uh, hidden from them uh, so as not to give too much information. And so my dad developed this code. Anyways, um, the deal fell through when, uh, when uh, the contracts came through and they, they were only offering my father a uh, – they wanted him to fly out to Los Angeles and do it on, on, do it on tape, the film – and uh, they were going to give him $100 a day per diem, and I'm on the phone to Costner and going, are you, are you kidding me? You're, this is an insult to my father. You're offering him, uh, you know, no down payment on, on this, which was required, a million dollars down payment and, uh, and, and a $5 million check at the end, and, or $4 million check at the end, a total of five. And, uh, and you're, you, you want this, you want my father, who's 80-plus years old, he's sick, to fly? I mean, the... the the freaking flight w- w- could probably kill him. Or you know, this is uh, this is absolutely intolerable. And and Kevin Costner just said, "Well, you know, then we're not going to do it. I'm not going to put a million dollars down on something I don't know. I want your father, your father to tell me everything he knows first. And I go, "Well, that's just not going to happen, Mr. Costner. You know, I'm very sorry, but you know, the, the contract stipulates that we that uh, that we're given the million dollars, uh, and we've already given you enough information. He goes, yeah, but that information uh, he doesn't have any of the, right, of the names and the dates. You know, how do I know it's real? And I go, you just gonna, it, this has got to be on the level of trust. And it, the, the conversation ended badly, and uh, so that was the end of that. You know, that's interesting because Costner is a, a, a bizarre character to begin with. Like like that whole thing about the when the um, uh, the oil spill happened. In the Gulf, you yeah. know, and he had some inventors with a machine that could clean the oil, and he's testifying before Congress. Like, what is this guy running around doing? You know, the guy's <laughs> you know Co- Costner. I mean, the Costner's not not satisfied with being, you know, world acclaimed actor and movie yeah. producer and director. He wants to be the someone savior. that brings something, you know, significant historically and politically, or, or, or you know, or scientifically to the world. And so, if it wasn't. Uh, the JFK assassination, then it's going to be the oil spill, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was strange talking to him because he kept kept saying to me, he "Goes, you know, you're you're talking to Kevin Costner, you know." And I go, "Oh, really, Mr. Costner? I know I know who I'm speaking with. I'm I'm speaking with Kevin Costner." And he goes, "You know, you're not going to just do, screw me for a bunch of money and 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 squeeze this out for your own benefit." I mean, he was kind of rude and. Uh, and kind of brusque, you know, it's like, you know, he was Kevin Costner and he was going to call all the shots and it was going to be done his way or no way. And then I'm like, well, you know, I, I appreciate you taking your time, sir. Um, you know, I, I love your films, um, but uh, this is just not going to happen the way that you're saying it. Uh, you, you've got to come, you got to come halfway. you got to meet, meet my dad halfway. And as a matter of fact, my dad is not going to be flying to Los Angeles or any other damn place. You're going to bring the film crew to him if and when, he says it's all right to do that. Uh, my father is the one calling the moves here, and I'm sorry, but you're not. So you know, it was a click, goodbye, click, click type thing, you know. But um, and the next day, yeah, he was kind of a weird guy, I guess. <laughs> the next day, six Cubans got on a plane, went to Costa's house. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's right. He woke up with a, uh, a, a, a severed bull's head in his bed. Or a, chi- a chicken's head in his bed. <laughs> yeah, a chicken's head in his brain, yeah. The, the mysterious disappearance of the Guadalajara <laughs> chicken. Oh, my God. But now, while this, I guess this is where the tension began with, with you and the, and the other side of the family. Is that what started things going, going south yes. with that? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's when it started because, because my dad had made all these promises to his wife, you know, that no, he didn't know about this and he didn't wasn't involved in that, and and he and, and he kept, you know, it was very difficult for him. He, he they had a, a year or two prior to this, they had just gone through a really rough period where it had been found out by her that my father had been unfaithful, and she left. She was right. gone, and my father came out to California, and he was just brokenhearted, and he, he's, you know, he enlisted my help to try to win his wife Laura back, and uh, and I I helped him with that, and and she did come back. Uh, they went to you know various therapies together, and uh, priests, you know, for uh, advice and counsel and things, and. I don't believe my dad was ever unfaithful after that. Although in his whole lifetime. I don't think he was ever faithful to my mother or to uh, his second wife until this happened, uh, when Laura actually left. And she was gone, you know, the better part of a year. And, uh, you know, she was uh, 20, 30 years younger than my dad. So, uh, you know, this, this, was, uh, this was someone that was going to be with him in his 
old, old age, and she did stick with him 